I probably feel this more than anyone else in this church because I am the father of this ministry and I am quite aware that the kingdom of God is not a religion it's a community and when one thing happens in a community it affects the whole community and so the Bible says when one of us rejoice then everybody could rejoice with that person but it also says that one of us mourns and everybody mourns with that person and so uh, the whole principle there is nothing in the community of the kingdom of God is isolated and so we feel the pain of those who are affected by the recent tragedies that took place I extended my condolences to the families already I also did it in writing to the families and I want to thank Pastor Richard for his leadership during this past week and the team of our leaders and pastors who have done so well in navigating these moments of of shock and trauma and I believe that Pastor Richard deserves a big hand for his leadership Thank you, Pastor Richard. I had to continue to minister to thousands of people through all of that. So if you think that things are difficult sometimes on your side of the world, it's when you get to stand before 15,000 people and still deliver. And uh, I could only do that because I knew we had good, solid leadership here and uh, never skipped a beat. Thank you, Pastor Pat and Farquharson and Pastor Henry and others who, who are leading this great work. Uh, I asked the Lord, uh, like you have, some questions as well. And I guess when things happen in life, you always have questions. And before I get into the word he gave me, God spoke to me specifically. That's why I had to leave the country I was in to get here he says go home and deliver this word to the people today and so I am here on instruction from the government and I've come to talk to the community first I want to say everything is gonna be all right everything praise God uh, I want to hope they got the screens working can you switch me please I want to uh, to speak to you today on the power of kingdom faith the power of kingdom faith I want to give you uh, just a brief look for two or three seconds at what I was doing while you didn't see me this is what we were doing this past week this is me standing next to my interpreter in Brazil we were in Brazil speaking as you can see to a massive crowd and they came seeking the message of the kingdom of God they flew me from London all the way to Brazil because they wanted to hear what you hear every week they want to hear it once and they packed that massive stadium and we saw the response of people coming by the thousands and while the devil was active here God was busy there God gets the glory no matter what happens can I hear an amen as people come to receive salvation and so I want to thank you for standing firm in Jesus name please write this down on top of your page and you can turn the lights up please kingdom faith say that with me kingdom. say this loud kingdom. this will probably be one of the defining moments in your life as a kingdom citizen this morning I want to talk about keys to building a stable faith keys 
to building what? A stable faith. I'd like to begin this morning with the questions that always plague life. I call them the mysteries of life. These questions that are constantly in the minds of maybe six billion people in the world, including the one sitting in your chair right now. And here's one I think that you need to write down. There are questions in life we can never answer. First, you must settle that. Because if you don't come to that conclusion, you will always be depressed. I decided that over 30 years ago, so that's why I have no depression. I have no problems, I have no frustrations in my life because I solved that issue 30 years ago. There are questions I will never be able to answer. Number two, there are things in life we can never explain. Settle that now. When you want an explanation for everything, you will always be depressed. There are things in life you will never explain. Number three, write this down. There are things in life we can never change. 30 years ago, I settled that. So I have a good time, no matter what happens. You got to settle that. Weeping, worrying, wailing, don't change some things, except your blood pressure. So settle it in your heart. There's some things you cannot change. Number four, there are things in life you cannot control. Settle it. If this man wants to leave you, you can put a gallon of oil on his pillar and pray in tongues a million days. If he wants to leave you, that's his will. You can't control it. Get settled in some things in life. This woman want to take drugs? She's your sister, you love her? But you can't control her going back to the base house. There's some things you can't control. You got to settle it. Question number five. There are things in life we cannot stop. You know, I came to that conclusion 30 years ago. There's some things you cannot stop. So what you do is you make arrangement for it to pass you. Let me say that again. There's some things you cannot stop. So you make arrangement for it to pass you. Because if you can't stop it and you get in front of it, it will still go where it's going, but you'll be destroyed. Number six, there are things in life we are not responsible for. Say it and write it down. You sent your child to college. You paid the tuition. You tried your best and they still came out and did some dumb things. You could not be responsible for that child's decisions. Settle it. I say to you, number seven, there are things in life we cannot exceed. And this is an important one because sometimes we think that we are all of that. One of my favorite statements in life that have kept me at peace is this one. I don't know. Say it. Say it again. That's the most powerful statement you can make in life. There are some things that exceed you.
goes beyond me. And it keeps me peaceful. So how do you face life with all these questions? Here's a thought. The key to, to life is a couple of things. Number one, knowing what is your limitation. You've got to know your limitation. If you believe that you are more than you are, then the Bible says you are not wise. You've got to know where the line is drawn, when you've got to stop, when you can't go no further, when you can't get beyond something. You've got to know your limitations, and my limitations keep me peaceful. Success in life, write this down, is when you know what you are responsible for. You know some things that you are responsible for. For example, your own decisions. You cannot blame anyone for something you decided. You have to know your responsibility. But number three is important. You also got to know what is your responsibility and what is not your responsibility. There are some things I discovered that even God doesn't take responsibility for. Like controlling your will. God died on the cross for you. Gave his life for us. Shed his blood for our redemption. Went to hell on our behalf. Took the keys of death, hell in the grave. Came back out of the tomb. Rose again. And he still cannot save us without our permission. He knows his limitation. It is self-imposed. He knows what he won't cross. He will never violate your will. So we got to know what we are not responsible for. And this one, this next one is very important. You got to know what you cannot do. Listen, sometimes your children do dumb things. You shouldn't walk around for 40 years feeling guilty about that. They're old enough now. I remember when my younger brother, who is now a preacher, he's an ordained minister. I remember he got involved in a little bit of negative company and got involved in a little experiment with drugs. And he's the only one in the family that got involved in that. And he's the only one that went to a Christian school, all expense paid. All of us went to government school. Mama died didn't pay nothing for us. They paid for this one. And he got in drugs. And I remember one day, the police called the house, and I heard my mother say, take him to jail. And she hung the phone up. I said, I love this mother. Why? He's an adult, she says. Do you know he's out of jail now and he's a preacher? Sometimes you got to go to jail to get your anointing. And some of them parents would say, don't send him. Mom would say, send him. He old enough to make his own decisions. You got to know what you cannot do. You cannot make people do things. Write this down, please. And this is what I have come to save my life 30 years ago. Everybody say, let God be God. Say it loud. Say it louder. Say God loud. Let God be God. Do you know what the greatest temptation in human is? Life? is attempting to be God. We have the greatest temptation to be God. Now, we are gods, but we ain't God. Let me tell you what I mean by that. There are things only God can do. Write that down. This message comes right from God to you today. There's some things only God can do. Settle that. Number two, there are things only God knows. Number six, there are things in life we are not responsible for. Say it and write it down. You sent your child to college. You paid the tuition. You tried your best and they still came out and did some dumb things. You could not be responsible for that child's decisions.
settle it. I say to you, number seven, there are things in life we cannot exceed. And this is an important one because sometimes we think that we are all of that. One of my favorite statements in life that have kept me at peace is this one. I don't know. Say it. Say it again. That's the most powerful statement you can make in life. There are some things that exceed you. It goes beyond me. And it keeps me peaceful. So how do you face life with all these questions? Here's a thought. The key to, to life is a couple of things. Number one, knowing what is your limitation. You've got to know your limitation. If you believe that you are more than you are, then the Bible says you are not wise. You've got to know where the line is drawn, when you've got to stop, when you can't go no further. When you can't get beyond something, you got to know your limitations. And my limitations keep me peaceful. Success in life, write this down, is when you know what you are responsible for. You know some things that you are responsible for. For example, your own decisions. You cannot blame anyone for something you decided. You have to know your responsibility. But number three is important. You also got to know what is your responsibility and what is not your responsibility. There are some things I discovered that even God doesn't take responsibility for. Like controlling your will. God died on the cross for you. Gave his life for us. Shed his blood for our redemption. Went to hell on our behalf. Took the keys of death, hell in the grave. Came back out of the tomb. Rose again. And he still cannot save us without our permission. He knows his limitation. It is self-imposed. He knows what he won't cross he will never violate your will so we got to know what we are not responsible for and this one is next one is very important you got to know what you cannot do listen sometimes your children do dumb things you shouldn't walk around for 40 years feeling guilty about that they are old enough now I remember when my younger brother who is now a preacher he's an ordained minister I remember he got involved in a little bit of negative company and got involved in a little experiment with drugs and he's the only one in the family that got involved in that. And he's the only one that went to a Christian school, all expense paid. All of us went to government school. Mama died didn't pay nothing for us. They paid for this one. And he got in drugs. And I remember one day the police called the house and I heard my mother say, take him to jail. And she hung the phone up. I said, I love this mother. Why? He's an adult, she says. Do you know he's out of jail now and he's a preacher? Sometimes you got to go to jail to get your anointing. And some of them parents would say, don't send him. Mom would say, send him. He's old enough to make his own decisions. You got to know what you cannot do. You cannot make people do things. Write this down, please. And this is what I have come to save my life 30 years ago. Everybody say, let God be God. Say it loud. Say it louder. Say God loud. Let God be God. Do you know what the greatest temptation in human is, life, is attempting to be God. We have the greatest temptation to be God. Now, we are gods, but we ain't God. Let me tell you what I mean by that. There are things 
only God can do. Write that down. This message comes right from God to you today. There's some things only God can do. Settle that. Number two, there are things only God knows. You will never know everything God knows. And there's some things God knows that he won't tell you. Why? Well, it ain't none of your business. It's a God's business. You don't know what God knows. So let God know what he knows. And what you know, you deal with what you know. That's all you want to deal with is what you know. What you don't know, let God know that. That keeps you peaceful. Number three, let God be God. Why? There are things only God understands. And I know you probably said that many times, but it's true. God understands some things only he understands. That's why I go to sleep. I remember one time I was up worrying about something. This was over 30 years ago. I dealt with this 30 years ago. And the Lord says, look, two of us ain't got to be up. spoke to me just clearly he says two of us ain't gonna be up i don't slumber so you sleep i went to bed tell your neighbor don't sweat it go to sleep this week i got no problems number four write this down there are things only god can explain friends if you try to explain things only God can explain, you're going to become yourself an explanation. An explanation mark. The greatest thing you could ever say when you start dealing with God is, I don't know. This little finite brain that grew up in McCullough Corner tries to argue with God. Are you crazy? You from an island two miles wide. You're going to talk to the God who rules 500 million galaxies. How dare you? Yeah, but we love to argue with God. There's some things only God could explain. So go to bed. And some of you are putting yourself under unnecessary pressure, trying to explain things only God could explain. Relax your brain. And go eat a good sandwich. Let God be God. Why? Because you got to know your limit. You only know what he allows you to know. And he don't allow you to know too much. <laughs> because your mental capacity to contain God's vast knowledge <laughs> is impossible. So God gives us sentences. And he has a library. And this sentence can last your lifetime. I put this to you. That what God is after is strong faith. Now, I'm going to drive this home today, and God's going to heal your mind. Everybody say strong faith. Strong. Write this down, please. Your faith is only as strong as the test it survives. Listen to me. I am the shepherd of this flock. Y'all listen to me. Don't read no newspaper. Don't listen to nobody. God sent me to talk to you. Your faith is only as strong as the test it survives. That's what he told me to tell you. It's amazing. So how strong are you? You are only as strong as what you can lift. Comprende? Yeah. In other words, for you to know your strength, you got to find something to test it. So you can never brag on your strength. Unless you test it.
So many of you are walking around for years, singing hallelujah, dancing up here, shouting, testifying, coming up at the microphone, telling how good God is. And then God said, let me see how strong they are. The Lord is good. You might say, yeah, let me test that scripture in your life, God says. My, my God shall supply. And then God takes everything from you to see if you believe he supplies. He tests to see if you think you're strong. How strong are you? Well, the only as strong as the test you survive. That's why God sent me to your life today. Because you got to understand, first of all, what is your motive for following God? Write that down, please. This is the heart of life. What is your motive for calling Jesus your Lord and entering the kingdom? Why did you come into the kingdom of God? What motivated you? Because your motivation will be tested. John chapter 6, I thought it was important to, to share something with you. It says in verse 24 of John 6, When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Everybody say, seeking Jesus. You know, everybody wants to look for Jesus. They say he can help you. He can pay your bills. He can pay your mortgage off. He can heal your body. He can cast out demons out of your life. He can help your children. He can save your marriage. He, he, he can. And so we go looking for him, even if it takes a ship. They were looking for Jesus. Watch this. It says in verse 25, and when they had found him. Hey, boys, say I found him. So if you're born again, that means you found him. When they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, where did you come from? In other words, we were looking for you. We found you finally. Jesus answered, You seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat fish and bread. Wow. Crowds looking for Jesus. Massive ministry. Big church. Everybody looking for Jesus. Jesus, I, I know why you're all coming. You ain't looking for me. You're looking for a blessing. Fish. Bread. Free fish. And free bread. See, the day before, they had just gotten free whale of sandwiches. Oh, don't we love God to bless us? Just anoint us, Lord. Just bring everything, God. The Lord promised he will bless us. He will add things to me. Yeah, he said, but you're looking for me, not for me to add things to you because you love me. What if I don't add today? He said, look, yes, I know you're looking for me, but I know why. Your motive is... You want the good things from me only. And you want them free. You want a free life in Christ. You want to be blessed. And then he answers them. He's capacity to contain God's vast knowledge <laughs> is impossible. So God gives us sentences. And he has a library. And this sentence can last your lifetime. I put this to you, that what God is after is strong faith. Now, I'm going to drive this home today, and God's going to heal your mind. Everybody say strong faith. Oh. Write this down, please. Your faith is only as strong as the test it survives. Listen to me. I am the shepherd of this flock. Y'all listen to me. Don't read no newspaper. Don't listen to nobody. God sent me to talk to you. Your faith is only as strong 
as the test it survives. That's what he told me to tell you. It's amazing. So how strong are you? You are only as strong as what you can lift. Comprende? Yeah. In other words, for you to know your strength, you got to find something to test it. So you can never brag on your strength. Unless you test it. So many of you are walking around for years singing hallelujah, dancing up here, shouting, testifying, coming up at the microphone, telling how good God is. And then God said, let me see how strong they are. The Lord is good. You might say, yeah, let me test that scripture in your life, God says. My, my God shall supply. And then God takes everything from you to see if you believe he supplies. He tests to see if you think you're strong. How strong are you? Well, you're only as strong as the test you survive. That's why God sent me to your life today. Because you've got to understand, first of all, what is your motive for following God? Write that down, please. This is the heart of life. What is your motive for calling Jesus your Lord? And entering the kingdom. Why did you come into the kingdom of God? What motivated you? Because your motivation will be tested. John chapter 6. I thought it was important to, to share something with you. It says in verse 24 of John 6. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there. Neither his disciples. They also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Everybody say, seeking Jesus. You know, everybody wants to look for Jesus. They say he can help you. He can pay your bills. He can pay your mortgage off. He can heal your body. He can cast out demons out of your life. He can help your children. He can save your marriage. He, he, he can. And so we go looking for him, even if it takes a ship. They were looking for Jesus. Watch this. It says in verse 25, and when they had found him. Hey, boy, say, I found him. So if you're born again, that means you found him. When they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, where did you come from? In other words, we were looking for you. We found you finally. Jesus answered, you seek me not because you saw the miracles but because you did eat fish and bread. Wow. Crowds looking for Jesus. Massive ministry, big church, everybody looking for Jesus. Jesus, I, I know why you're all coming. You ain't looking for me. You're looking for a blessing. Fish, bread, free fish, and free bread. See, the day before, they had just gotten free whaler sandwiches. Oh, don't we love God to bless us? Just anoint us, Lord, just bring everything, God. The Lord promised he will bless us. He will add things to me. Yeah, he said, but you're looking for me, not for me to add things to you because you love me. What if I don't add today? He said, look, yes, I know you're looking for me, but I know why. Your motive is you want the good things from me only, and you want them free. You want a free life in Christ. You want to be blessed. And then he answers them. He says, look, work not for the meat which perishes. 
Don't use your faith on things that can go away in the morning. He says, but for me, which endureth how long? Unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him God the Father had sealed. The only thing that is sealed in life is Christ. You all better write that down. See, this 30 years ago, I figured it out. That's why the visionaries made it through the storm of persecution. When they called me a cult... In 1980, when BFM started, I knew it was too late. I'd already seen the sealed one. When they told me I was teething the money. And they wrote in the papers, front page on me, negative. I was in the, in the sideburns twice a week. But I had to keep believing God. You ain't been tested yet. He says, look, I'm the only one that is sealed. God is saying, the rent I paid for you ain't sealed. So don't put your faith in the fact that I gave you the rent payment. Sometimes we only follow God because he blesses us. We don't follow God. We believe in God because people live. Do you believe in God because people die also? God's kingdom is so strong, nothing can move it. I put it to you. Watch him in the book, John 6, 28. Then they said unto him, what shall we do then? That we might work the works of God. Okay, Jesus, so what should we do? Since we shouldn't follow you for bread and for fish, and for what we can get from you, what should we do? He says, okay, let me answer you. Watch this. He said, this is the work of God. Simple. That you believe on him whom he sent. Don't believe on the bread. Don't believe on the fish. Don't believe on the miracles. Don't put your faith in the activities of God. Because he might not act sometimes. He says, the greatest work that you can do is belief. Everybody say belief. Say it loud. The word belief, write it down, belief, is the word Jesus used here, P-I-S-T-I-S. -T -I -S. Write it down. Believe. Pistis. P-I-S-T-I-S. It's the exact same word as faith. Write it down. Faith. Belief. Pistis. Faith. He says... He says, the greatest work you can do in life is to have faith in the one God sent. Not the things he does. Remember now, he said, I know why you're following me. Your motive is what you can get. And as long as things are going good and I'm giving you fish and bread, then you want to come follow me. He said, but forget the stuff. I want you to follow and believe in me, not the fish, not the bread. He's shifting our motivation from things to him. Because things change. Are you following this? It's very important. Now he goes on and closes this thing. I love this. He says, our fathers did eat. The people talking now. Our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it's written, he gave them bread from heaven. Now what's it, what, what are they talking about? They said, look, in the past we had many miracles, man. Yes, sir. God saved this one. God healed that one. God redeemed that one. God delivered that one. That was in prison and God brought that one out of prison. God did this. He said, come on, Jesus. God did a lot of things. And they're giving Jesus Christ a report card on what he did. They were trying to convince him that the reason why we follow Moses is because of the miracles. But Jesus answered. Jesus said unto them, truly, truly, I say unto you, Moses gave you, not that bread that came down from heaven. Why? Because the miracles are temporary. <laughs> the mortgage payment is temporary. Do you know God could actually bless you with a car and then next we take it away? Because the car is temporary. Why? The car didn't come from heaven. It came from Ford. <laughs> 
And God can provide the bank payment. Or God can test you and see if you can have peace if you miss a payment. He's God. We don't know what he's thinking. Christ says, therefore, you put your faith not in the things of God, but in the God of the things. Watch him now. He says, but my father giveth you the true bread that came down from heaven. Now, wait a minute. So there's two kinds of bread here in life. There's bread. That's the blessings. Then there's another bread that came down from heaven. Let's read what that bread is. Verse 34. Then they said unto him, Lord, even more, give us this bread. He answered them, I am the bread. Ladies and gentlemen, are you following Jesus Christ or are you following BFM? Is your faith in Jesus Christ, the bread from heaven, or is it in the blessings you get, the bread from earth? Let me tell you something, my friends. I speak to you as a senior pastor. If anybody should acquit the ministry, it's me. You don't know my story. The secret harassment, phone calls, letters from pastors, threats, and I had to make it through. It's been 39 years, and I'm still standing. And you've been saved for 10, and you call it tough. Listen, you are only as strong as what your faith survives. Please don't disappoint me now. Don't tell me that all my teaching for 50 years or 30 years or 20 years is going to be knocked over by an incident. Where is your faith? It's in God. The bread that came down from heaven. Look what he says. He says, he that cometh to me and eat me shall never hunger. I was thinking this morning, listen carefully please, on the way here on the aircraft flying in, I was thinking, my mind was racing. Holy Spirit was just speaking to me so loud. He said to me, he said, do you know that when me and the disciples went on the, on the ship, the little boat, he said, do you know that I am God? I can do anything. He said, do you know I could have prevented the storm? Come on, look at me. Look, this is very important. He says, I, listen, he says, I can stop the storm from starting rather than stopping it after it started. Either way, I'm God. I can stop the wind before it blew or let it blow and then stop it. He said, it doesn't matter. I could have stopped it. He said, but I set it up. I set it up because it wasn't about me. It was about these three guys who I was testing to trust with the church. I had to trust them to see if they could handle a little bit of pressure. Right. And he said to make sure. Everybody say belief. Say it loud. The word belief, write it down, belief, is the word Jesus used here. P-I-S-T-I-S. -T -I -S. Write it down. Believe. Pistis. P-I-S-T-I-S. -I it's the exact same word as faith. Write it down. Faith. Belief. Pistis, faith. He says, he says the greatest work you can do in life is to have faith in the one God sent. Not the things he does. Remember now, he said, I know why you're following me. Your motive is what you can get. And as long as things are going good and I'm giving you fish and bread, then you want to come follow me. He said, but forget the stuff. I want you to follow and believe in me, not the fish, not the bread. He's shifting our motivation from things to him. Because things change. Are you following this? It's very important. Now he goes on and closes this thing. I love this. He says, our fathers did eat. The people talking now. Our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it's written, he gave them bread from heaven. Now what's he, what are they talking about? They said, look, in the past we had many miracles, man. 
Yes, sir. God saved this one. God healed that one. God redeemed that one. God delivered that one. That was in prison. And God brought that one out of prison. God did this. We, all it, he said, come on, Jesus. God did a lot of things. And they're giving Jesus Christ a report card on what he did. They were trying to convince him that the reason why we follow Moses is because of the miracles. But Jesus answered. Jesus said unto them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread that came down from heaven. Why? Because the miracles are temporary. The mortgage payment is temporary. Do you know God could actually bless you with a car and then next we take it away? Because the car is temporary. Why? The car didn't come from heaven. It came from Ford. <laughs> And God can provide the bank payment. Or God can test you and see if you can have peace if you miss a payment. He's God. We don't know what he's thinking. Christ says, therefore, you put your faith not in the things of God, but in the God of the things. Watch him now. He says, But my Father giveth you the true bread that came down from heaven. Now, wait a minute. So there's two kinds of bread here in life. There's bread. That's the blessings. Then there's another bread that came down from heaven. Let's read what that bread is. Verse 34. Then they said unto him, Lord, even more, give us this bread. He answered them, I am the bread. Ladies and gentlemen, are you following Jesus Christ or are you following BFM? Is your faith in Jesus Christ, the bread from heaven, or is it in the blessings you get, the bread from earth? Let me tell you something, my friends. I speak to you as a senior pastor. If anybody should acquit the ministry, it's me. You don't know my story. The secret harassment, phone calls, letters from pastors, threats, and I had to make it through. It's been 39 years, and I'm still standing. And you've been saved for 10, and you call it tough. Listen, you are only as strong as what your faith survives. Please don't disappoint me now. Don't tell me that all my teaching for 50 years or 30 years or 20 years is going to be knocked over by an incident. Where is your faith? It's in God. The bread that came down from heaven. Look what he says. He says, he that cometh to me and eat me shall never hunger. I was thinking this morning, listen carefully please, on the way here on the aircraft flying in, I was thinking, my mind was racing. Holy Spirit was just speaking to me so loud. He said to me, he said, do you know that when me and the disciples went on the, sh on the ship, the little boat, he said, do you know that I am God? I can do anything. He said, do you know I could have prevented the storm? Come on, look at me. Look, this is very important. He says, I, listen, he says, I could have stopped the storm from starting rather than stopping it after it started. Either way, I'm God. I could stop the wind before it blew or let it blow and then stop it. He said, doesn't matter. I could have stopped it. He said, but I set it up. I set it up because it wasn't about me. It was about these three guys who I was testing to trust with the church. I had to trust them to see if they could handle a little bit of pressure. Right. And he said to make sure they couldn't look at me. I went to sleep. Do you feel like God's sleeping on you right now? I say, you feel like God's sleeping on you? Where's God? Because I'm in the boat, but I'm sleeping. I'm still in the boat, but I'm snoring. I got one eye open checking how you react into the storm. Come on, somebody. And the Bible says when they woke him up, he did not stop the storm first. 
And that's where we are right now. He has waken up. He sent me because he's awake. And the question he asked him was, where is your faith? The storm is not the problem, he says. Your faith is only as strong as the, the problem it survives. He attacked them. He said, where's your faith? You can let a storm take away your peace. And the prince of peace is on board. And they were ashamed. He said, I really sent this, allowed this storm. Not sent, but allowed it to happen. Just to see your reaction. What kind, you, you all tell me you believe in me. You tell me that you're my disciple. You tell me that I am your God. I am your Messiah. He said, okay, let me see if you believe that I really am the Messiah. I'm going to go to sleep while there's a storm going on. You got faith in the storm or in the Messiah? And when the lesson was over, he stopped the storm. Whatever you're going through right now in your personal life is allowed by God. Now notice my words. I didn't say he generated it. It's allowed. The Bible says he will not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you are able to overcome. Which means that the test is equal to the faith. You should clap your hands right there. Good for you. you missed the whole revelation. If the test is big, that's what he thinks about you. Let me tell you something. The size of the, the test is God's way of saying, I believe this about you over other people. Amen. Glory, hallelujah. I say hallelujah. The bigger the test, the bigger the faith he got in you. He did not stop the storm until their faith survived it. My friends, he says, he that believeth on me shall never thirst. The water Moses gave you is temporary. The blessings you had is temporary. Ladies and gentlemen, we preach that the kingdom of God will meet your needs. Absolutely true. And Jesus did it. He paid their the mortgages. He, he paid their taxes. He caught fish for them. All that was fine. But they got excited with the fish and the taxes. And he said, no, 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 no. Forget what I gave you. Believe in me. You don't follow God because what you can get. Your faith. Kingdom faith is in the king. Not in the king's favor. Kingdom faith is in the king. Not the king's gifts. Yes, Lord. Wherein is your faith? Watch this, John 6, 53. I want you to read this now. Please don't be among these, okay? It says, Then Jesus said unto them, I say unto you, truly, truly, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Have anyone ever said this to you? Well, if God is so good, why is this happening to you? See, he's answering it. He says, look. He says, your relationship with God ain't got nothing to do with what happening to you. I'm going to say it again. Your relationship with God has nothing to do with what's happening to you. Could you imagine how Daniel felt? He's standing before the king Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar said, you know something? I'm putting you in the lion's den. Let him eat you. And Daniel started praying in tongues. He expected an angel to come. No angel showed up. He expected him to be vanished from the sight of this court. 
no vanishing took place. They put a chain on Dan. Dan figure, okay, God can catch me halfway down the hall. He can reduce the chain. God didn't show up. Where is my God? The one I told the king about. And then he heard the growlings of the lions down there in the den. And he figured God going to catch me just before the door opens. He's going to snatch me away, rapture. And then the door opened. No God. And then he walks inside. All the lions start circling him. And he figured God's going to make me vanish. And he doesn't vanish. Where is God? See, Daniel had to shift his trust from the works of God to God. Amen. If your faith is in God, it doesn't matter what happens around you. God is stable. Give God a big clap. Give him praise. He never shifts and moves. He's the same yesterday, the Bible says. He says, if you don't eat my flesh, don't eat the bread, the stuff I give you, eat me. Don't drink the water. Drink me, he says, my blood. He said, if you do that, then you will have life. You'll be able to live through anything. Let me give you something to think about. You're going to go through some more difficult things in the next few years. So brace yourself. This message is to prepare you for next month, next year, five years from here. You're going to remember, oh, Pastor Bob said that the test comes to test my faith. I'm going to stand. And after standing, I will stand. How strong are you? You are as strong as the which your faith survives. I have no fear of things getting the best we've ever seen. God's going to do some things to show off. But he check in everybody. One time the Lord told me, he says, look, he says, the, he says, some people can't even survive success. Your faith couldn't survive a million dollars. You forget about God. You go buy a car and boat and, and you know, house somewhere and, and just enjoy yourself, play golf. God says, wait a minute, you can't handle success. And so he withdraws everything from you. You know what Jesus said? I quote his words. He says, if you've been faithful over little first, let me test you with little. Then I'll trust you with more. It depends on whether you can manage the little first. Can you manage a little stress, problem, a little period of luck? Or do you start saying, God ain't working? Do you know many things... I had to wait 10 years for God to do. The bigger the test, the bigger the faith he got in you. He did not stop the storm until the faith survived it. My friends, he says, He that believeth on me shall never thirst. The water Moses gave you is temporary. The blessings you had is temporary. Ladies and gentlemen, we preach that the kingdom of God will meet your needs. Absolutely true. And Jesus did it. He paid their, their mortgages. He, he paid their taxes. He caught fish for them. All that was fine. But they got excited with the fish and the taxes. And he said, no, 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 no. Forget what I gave you. Believe in me. You don't follow God because what you can get. Your faith. Kingdom faith is in the king, not in the king's favor. Kingdom faith is in the king, not the king's gifts. Yes, Lord. Wherein is your faith? Watch this, John 6, 53. I want you to read this now. Please don't be among these, okay? It says, Then Jesus said unto them, I say unto you, truly, truly, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. 
Have anyone ever said this to you? Well, if God is so good, why is this happening to you? See, he's answering it. He says, look. He says, your relationship with God ain't got nothing to do with what happened to you. I'm going to say it again. Your relationship with God has nothing to do with what's happening to you. Could you imagine how Daniel felt? He's standing before the king Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar said, you know something? I'm putting you in the lion's den. Let him eat you. And Daniel started praying in tongues. He expected an angel to come. No angel showed up. He expected him to be vanished from the sight of this court. No vanishing took place. They put a chain on Daniel. Daniel figured, okay, God can catch me halfway down the hall. He can reduce the chain. God didn't show up. Where is my God? The one I told the king about. And then he heard the growlings of the lions down there in the den. And he figured God going to catch me just before the door opens. He's going to snatch me away with rapture. And then the door opened. No God. And then he walks inside. All the lions start circling him. And he figured God's going to make me vanish. And he doesn't vanish. Where is God? See, Daniel had to shift his trust from the works of God to God. If your faith is in God, it doesn't matter what happens around you. God is stable. Give God a big clap. Give him praise. He never shifts and moves. He's the same yesterday, the Bible says. He says, if you don't eat my flesh, don't eat the bread, the stuff I give you, eat me. Don't drink the water. Drink me, he says, my blood. He says, if you do that, then you will have life. You'll be able to live through anything. Let me give you something to think about. You're going to go through some more difficult things in the next few years. So brace yourself. This message is to prepare you for next month, next year. Five years from here, you're going to remember, oh, Pastor Miles said that the test comes to test my faith. I'm going to stand. And after standing, I will stand. How strong are you? You are as strong as the, with your faith survives. I have no fear of things getting the best we've ever seen. God's going to do some things to show off. But he check in everybody. One time the Lord told me, he says, look. He says, the, he says some people can't even survive success. Your faith couldn't survive a million dollars. You forget about God. You go buy a car and boat and, and you know, house somewhere and, and just enjoy yourself, play golf. God says, wait a minute, you can't handle success. And so he withdraws everything from you. You know what Jesus said? I quote his words. He says, if you've been faithful over little first, let me test you with little. Then I'll trust you with more. It depends on whether you can manage the little first. Can you manage a little stress, problem, a little period of lack? Or do you start saying, God ain't working? Do you know how many things I had to wait 10 years for God to do? And you want it in 10 days. As if you know everything God knows. God knows you can't handle it in 10 days. Because you ain't got the matured faith to handle it. Many times you think God didn't answer your prayer. No is an answer. Clap, praise God. Yeah, your seven-year-old girl come to you and say, Daddy, I want the car keys. And I want them now. What are you going to say to this seven-year-old? No. That's a prayer. She's praying. I pray thee. Let I have it the key. And your prayer, knoweth. No, that's an answer to prayer. 
Why? Tell me why you said no. Come on, tell me why. To protect the child. How many times you talk God didn't hear you and he was protecting you? Everybody say he knows everything. So when you don't know, trust what you know about him. He knows everything. That's why James wrote in his book, he says, always write, he says, if the Lord wills. In other words, I'm, I'm coming to see you, Pat, uh, if the Lord wills, because he might not want me to see you. <laughs> you can make a plan, because you know something, I, I got a bigger picture of this thing. That's the wrong timing to see her. I remember that time I got left in Atlanta. Plane left me. We arrived like, you know, 30 minutes too late. Plane left me. I was so upset because I wanted to come home and I was away for seven, eight days. I was angry. The plane just, you know, that some storm or stuff messed up my whole plan. And I'm upset in the airport. And the Lord spoke to me, you know. He said, shut up and sit down. So I, 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 I shut up. I shut up. I shut it up. <laughs> and I sat down. And I'm sitting there now. Trying to feel okay. All right, I'm sitting down. What now? And I heard someone call my name. And it was this guy walking down the airport. He says, I know you. You on TV. Huh? You Dr. Munro? I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm so-and-so. And so he shook my hand. I said, well, good to meet you. Yes. Come to find out, he was the guy who was going to publish my book. He was the publisher. He said, I was looking for you for months. He found me when a plane was missed. Now the books are in 80 countries. Sometimes God will give you an accident to give you a revelation. He knows everything. God shipwrecked the boat Paul was on. Is your boat shipwrecked at the moment? Do you feel like the whole thing shipwrecked? Yeah, it's a setup. He want to see if you can handle snakes. Where's your faith? Please write this down. Very important verse, John 6. Please read this carefully. He says, And many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard what he said, they said, This is a hard saying. He wants us to eat his flesh and drink his blood. In other words, he wants us to follow him without guarantee of fish and bread. He's crazy. The reason why I follow you is because I want fish and bread. You telling me, forget the fish and bread. Eat you? Are you crazy? In other words, your pastor telling you today. God is saying, don't follow me for what I can give you. Follow me for me. And if I don't give you, you still follow me. When you're going to eat, eat me. Glory, Jesus, hallelujah, praise God. He says, your faith should not be in what I give you, but the thing... That gave it to you is me. Look at him. They say this is a hard saying. You want us to just trust God for nothing. Boy, that's tough. Everything that you have, you will lose. You hear me? Ain't nothing permanent. I settled that years ago. My wife will die one day. I got to get used to the idea that I might have to live without my wife. You see, Sister Charia, Sister Charia, she's a blessing to me. Her husband was an awesome gift to this church. We prayed and fasted. We splashed oil on him. We, we prayed. God said, no. He did what he's supposed to do. And she's standing strong in the faith because she knows God knows things she doesn't know. When you don't know what to do, you trust God. I'm going to say this again because some of you ain't got it in your head yet. Everything you have, you will lose. That's not a negative prophecy. David says, some trust in chariots. 
Some trust in the sword. See, David had chariots. He tried it. And he lost some battles. He trusted in the sword. And he was defeated many times. He said, but when I put my trust in God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It didn't matter whether the battle was raging. I knew that the one I trusted is still the winner. Give God a praise. You're going to win no matter what happens around you. Bahamas Faith Ministries does not exist because of the good things that happen to its members. We exist because God raised up a vision in this nation to bless the world and he's doing a good job. We should give him a praise. Hallelujah. Yes, I thank God for Mother Trotman. We lost her sitting in that chair right there. We lost her. But we're still standing. And she's clapping in the, in the stand saying, Go, Miles, that's my boy. Go. Dr. Chara's still shouting. Pandora's still shouting. Go, boy. Go. Why? You ain't here forever either. We're going to bury you one day. You ain't going to stop the show. Because the show is not your show. Give God a praise. Hallelujah. This is a hard saying. Look at that. Boy, it's a hard message, Pastor Miles. You just want me to trust God? Let's see what they did. Next verse. It says, from that time, many of his disciples went back. Are you one of them? This ain't working. So I'm going to change churches. Yeah, right. You are a fish sandwich Christian. <laughs> Many of them went back. Why? Because he took away their bread and water and gave them his flesh and blood. He took away the gifts and he gave them the giver. They didn't want it. He took away salvation. And gave them the Savior. They didn't want it. He took away the blessings. And gave them the blesser. They didn't want it. Where's your faith? Who is it in? Your faith is not in what happens to people in this ministry. Sometimes God will give you an accident. To give you a revelation. He knows everything. God shipwrecked the boat Paul was on. Is your boat shipwrecked at the moment? Do you feel like the whole thing shipwrecked? Yeah, it's a setup. He want to see if you can handle snakes. Where's your faith? Please write this down. Very important verse John 6 please read this carefully he says and many therefore of his disciples when they heard what he said they said this is a hard saying he want us to eat his flesh and drink his blood in other words he want us to follow him without guarantee of fish and bread He's crazy. The reason why I follow you is because I want fish and bread. You telling me, forget the fish and bread. Eat you? Are you crazy? In other words, your pastor telling you today, God is saying, don't follow me for what I can give you. Follow me for me. And if I don't give you, you still follow me. When you're going to eat, eat me. Glory, Jesus, hallelujah, praise God. He says, your faith should not be in what I give you, but the thing that gave it to you is me. Look at him. They say this is a hard saying. You want us to just trust God for nothing. Boy, that's tough. Everything that you have, you will lose. You hear me? Ain't nothing permanent. 
I settled that years ago. My wife will die one day. I got to get used to the idea that I might have to live without my wife. You see, Sister Charia, Sister Charia, she's a blessing to me. Her husband was an awesome gift to this church. We prayed and fasted. We splashed oil on him. We, we prayed. God said, no. He did what he's supposed to do. And she's standing strong in the faith. Because she knows God knows things she doesn't know. When you don't know what to do, you trust God. I'm going to say this again, because some of you ain't got it in your head yet. Everything you have, you will lose. That's not a negative prophecy. David says, some trust in chariots. Some trust in the sword. See, David had chariots. He tried it. And he lost some battles. He trusted in the sword. And he was defeated many times. He said, but when I put my trust in God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It didn't matter whether the battle was raging. I knew that the one I trusted is still the winner. Give God a praise. You're going to win no matter what happens around you. Bahamas Faith Ministries does not exist because of the good things that happen to his members. We exist because God raised a provision in this nation to bless the world and he's doing a good job. We should give him a praise. Hallelujah. Yes, I thank God for Mother Trotman. We lost her sitting in that chair right there. We lost her. But we're still standing. And she's clapping in the, in the stand saying, Go, Miles, that's my boy. Go. Dr. Chara still shouting. Pandora still shouting. Go, boy. Go. Why? You ain't here forever either. We're going to bury you one day. You ain't going to stop the show. Because the show is not your show. Give God a praise. Hallelujah. This is a hard saying. Look at that. Boy, it's a hard message, Pastor Miles. You just want me to trust God? Let's see what they did. Next verse. It says, from that time, many of his disciples went back. Are you one of them? This ain't working. So I'm going to change churches. Yeah, right. You are a fish sandwich Christian. <laughs> Many of them went back. Why? Because he took away their bread and water and gave them his flesh and blood. He took away the gifts and he gave them the giver. They didn't want it. He took away salvation. And gave them the Savior. They didn't want it. He took away the blessings. And gave them the blesser. They didn't want it. Where's your faith? Who is it in? Your faith is not in what happens to people in this ministry. There are folks sitting next to you right now who will disappoint you in a few years. They're going to do some dumb things. And if I was depending on the lifestyle of people in this ministry and the commitment that they promised me, I would have quit a thousand years ago. But I am not leading this ministry because you are here. This is an assignment by my life from God. And God has given you one too to join this ministry to make it what it's supposed to be to impact the world. You're not here just to get fish and bread. You're here to change the world by feeding them the living bread. Come on, give God a praise. Hallelujah. May he bless your family because he put faith in him. Everybody say, trust in the Lord. Say it again, trust in the Lord. Read this verse again. It says, And many who followed him went back and walked no more with him. Sounds familiar? Church membership changing. People dropping out. 
Notice Christ didn't panic. Matter of fact, watch what he says. Then he said unto the twelve who were left. Always some, some folks left, you know. Faithful ones. He said, you won't go to? In other words, I'm not in this for y'all. Some people believe that if they leave you, you will become less. And they try to use that as a bargaining tool. And the Lord told me to leave. As if it's something special. He said, you want to go? Go. He told Peter, you want to go too? Go. I don't want no one around me for fish and bread. I want them around me for flesh and blood. Come on, give him a shout. Hallelujah. Put your faith in me, not my miracles. You want to go, he says? Is that how strong your faith is? It's as strong as missing a meal. Fish and bread. No fish, no bread, no follow. That's what they're saying. No fish, no bread, no follow. My faith is as strong as fish and bread. If you don't bless me, I ain't coming, God. Boy, I wonder what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would say to you when you get to heaven. You lousy thing, you. We went into fire without him. We went into the fire hoping he would save us. And he showed up in the fire. He didn't protect us from the furnace. He didn't keep us from going in. He let us go in. We need some fire Christians. You in the fire? So what? There's a fourth man around. He's right here this morning. Praise God. Holy Ghost is running up and down this building right now shouting, preach, pastor, preach. He's telling me, preach. Why? Put your faith in God. I remember Shadrach told Meshach and the big Negro. He said, look. He said, let's tell the king this. You should read this in the book of Daniel. He says, look. If the Lord delivers us, fine. If he doesn't deliver us, fine. That's what they said. Is that the kind of faith you get? If we lose the house, I still trust God. If we keep the house, I still trust God. I dare you. I dare you. Where's your faith? Sometimes we get faith in faith. And not faith in God. Verse 68. And then a member of BFM, Simon, answered him and said, <laughs> Lord, to whom shall we go? In other words, look, where are we going? The words of life are with you, he says. We're getting the word here with you. Where are we going? An incident of missing a meal can't take us away from you. A lack of sandwiches will never remove us from you. When we don't get what we want and things don't work out the way we wanted it, we still ain't going nowhere. Why? Because we still ain't find nobody better than you, God. Let me tell you something. The folks who sometimes will criticize you in the midst of a storm ain't got no God to go to. So why are you listening to them? Come on, give them a praise. You got a God to go to and to cast your cares upon. That's why I don't waste my time. Because I ain't going to let no one punch me. My faith is in God. The storms that I've been through and that many of you have been through have prepared you for every other storm. So be faithful to God. Hallelujah. I should be faithful to God. Read the last part. It says, <laughs> And we believe that you are surely the Son of God, the Christ. Notice what Peter did? He shifted from bread to believing, belief in Jesus. 
I believe it was at this point where Jesus really took Peter in and said, I'm going to train you to be the next leader. Because Peter shifted from bread. Remember? First it was fish. He caught fish for Peter. And Peter says, I'll follow you, man. You, you keep my business going. What if he doesn't keep your business going? Remember now, the first catch of fish was a business deal. Peter's business was going good because Jesus provided resources for the business. His faith was in fish. Now it was in bread. And Christ says, no, not even bread. And now Peter shifts. He says, I believe in you. Is that where you are now? Let me tell you something. I discovered something about God. God is the rock. Say it. The Bible calls him the rock. You know the, the rock. Ladies and gentlemen, if you anchor on the rock, it doesn't matter the storm. Put your faith in the rock. Peter says, you the Christ, I believe. And Jesus answered them and says, have I not chosen you twelve and one of you? Even in these twelve is the devil. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. It's very important. I don't know who that might be in this room. And remember, he was close. He ain't one of the 70. He was in the top part of the ministry. Here's what's important about this. Jesus kept on going. I'm going to say it again. Jesus kept on going it, it doesn't matter who's around you he just kept on going he said the father gave me work to do i'm gonna do the father's work don't let people remove you from the father's work by the way i think it's important to note that that was the one who committed suicide. And Jesus kept on going. Say it. And Jesus kept on going. What stops your faith? Going in. He let us go in. We need some fire Christians. You're in the fire, so what? There's a fourth man around. He's right here this morning. Praise God. Amen. Holy Ghost is running up and down this building right now, shouting, Preach, Pastor, preach. He's telling me, preach. Why? Put your faith in God. I remember Shadrach told me, Shaq, and the big Negro. He said, Look, he said, Let's tell the king this. You should read this in the book of Daniel. He says, Look, if the Lord delivers us, fine. If he doesn't deliver us, fine. That's what they said. Is that the kind of faith you get? If we lose the house, I still trust God. If we keep the house, I still trust God. I dare you. I dare you. Where's your faith? Sometimes we get faith in faith and not faith in God. Verse 68. And then a member of BFM, Simon, answered him and said, <laughs> Lord, to whom shall we go? In other words, look, where are we going? The words of life are with you, he says. We're getting the word here with you. Where are we going? An incident of missing a meal can't take us away from you. A lack of sandwiches will never remove us from you. When we don't get what we want and things don't work out the way we wanted it, we still ain't going nowhere. Why? Because we still ain't find nobody better than you, God. Let me tell you something. The folks who sometimes will criticize you in the midst of a storm, ain't got no God to go to. So why are you listening to them? Come on, give them a praise. You got a God to go to 
and to cast your cares upon. That's why I don't waste my time, because I ain't going to let no one punch me. My faith is in God. The storms that I've been through and that many of you have been through have prepared you for every other storm. So be faithful to God. Hallelujah. I said be faithful to God. Read the last part. It says, <laughs> And we believe that you are surely the Son of God, the Christ. Notice what Peter did? He shifted from bread to believing, belief in Jesus. I believe it was at this point where Jesus really took Peter in and said, I'm going to train you to be the next leader. Because Peter shifted from bread. Remember? First it was fish. He caught fish for Peter. And Peter says, I'll follow you, man. You, you keep my business going. What if he doesn't keep your business going? Remember now, the first catch of fish was a business deal. Peter's business was going good because Jesus provided resources for the business. His faith was in fish. Now it was in bread. And Christ says, no, not even bread. And now Peter shifts. He says, I believe in you. Is that where you are now? Let me tell you something. I discovered something about God. God is the rock. Say it. The Bible calls him the rock. You know the, the rock. Ladies and gentlemen, if you anchor on the rock, it doesn't matter the storm. Put your faith in the rock. Peter says, Are you the Christ? I believe. And Jesus answered them and says, Have I not chosen you twelve and one of you? Even in this twelve is a devil. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. It's very important. I don't know who that might be in this room. And remember, he was close. He ain't one of the 70. He was in the top part of the ministry. Here's what's important about this. Jesus kept on going. I'm going to say it again. Jesus kept on going. It, it doesn't matter who's around you. He just kept on going. He said, the Father gave me work to do. I'm going to do the Father's work. Don't let people remove you from the Father's work. By the way, I think it's important to note that that was the one who committed suicide. And Jesus kept on going. Say it. And Jesus kept on going. What stops your faith? Suicide of his personal friend could not stop him from going. I'm sure Jesus felt that hurt because Judas was part of the team. He chose him. But he couldn't stop him. He couldn't stop from making private deals. I don't know what's going on in your house. Judas was making private deals on the side. What's going on in your house? You come as a member, people think you're fine. What's going on in your house? Now, they could have blamed Jesus and said, you know, Jesus, you caused him to commit suicide. Jesus said, don't put that on me. Jesus never took credit for it. Or responsibility. He says, Judas, do what you have to do. It's amazing. Whatever stops you is the strength of your faith. And so, Miles Monroe, Bahamas Faith Ministries, we're going to keep on going. And keep on going. And keep on going. 
Why? Because we come to finish the work he gave us to do. And he knows things we don't know. He can do things we cannot do. And he can explain things you could never explain. So just keep on going. You know, some people in this room are living in the past and it's weighing you down. You're still carrying load from people who hurt your feelings 10 years ago or disappointed you five years ago and you ain't moving ahead. And God is saying, look, cut that off and keep on going. You got a life ahead of you. You got things to accomplish, big things to do for God. Cut that thing off. We got to forgive people and we got to bless them and don't speak evil of them and then keep on going don't try to second guess nobody's motive what you don't understand leave it to God put your trust in God and then keep on going let me tell you something in case you don't understand this I figured it 30 years ago because when you leave we can forget you. And we're going to keep on going. Listen, you ain't that important as you think you are. You know, let me tell you, sometimes you say, well, if I don't show up, ain't nothing going to happen. Oh, you'll be amazed. You will be amazed. <laughs> tell your neighbor, do your part. Do it well. And move on. That's all God wants you to do. Don't get on up table how important you are. You know, if I don't do this, then ain't nothing going to happen. Let me tell you something. God can get rid of me in the morning. Matter of fact, I have a blank sheet in my life right now. Whatever God says to do, I do. Hold on to nothing tight. Just keep on going. Let me close with this, please. Write this down. This is very important. I'm going to give you a, a, a list. Success is measured by your ability to maintain personal balance in times of turmoil. Maturity is your ability to manage the expected and the unexpected. I can tell you how matured you are by what you do under pressure. It doesn't matter how much you talk, how great you are. I check how you react under pressure. Because that is the measure of your maturity. Those who are matured in the faith are willing to be tried in the furnace. Success in life is your capacity to manage turmoil and keep your balance in the middle of it. Hey, y'all, keep your balance. Christ is the same. I like what the Bible says. The Bible says God is light. And in him there is no darkness, nor any shadow of turning. He doesn't wave even an inch. He is steady. And then he says, imitate me like dear children. Be steady. We will stay steady because what is over our heads is still under his feet. What a blessing. How do you respond to tragedy is a measure of your maturity. You know, my, my brother, Paul, who grew up with me, he and I were like twins. Uh, he was one year older than me. We were together all the time. Matter of fact, his name was Paul, and we were so close, they ended up me calling me Peter. So most of the folks who know me from a little boy knew that they called me Peter. Matter of fact, some folks didn't even know I was named Miles. Because my brother and I were so close. Whenever they saw it, we were always together like a twin. He said, Peter and Paul, Peter and Paul, Peter and Paul. My brother died in my hands. I remember he told me, my brother had an accident. I sped up there, slam brakes, went to the road. Everybody on the side. I went to the road, man, there's blood. My brother had a big hole in my brother's head. And I hold my brother. And I start praying, God, you can raise the dead. Raise my brother. And I buried my brother here. How can you handle tragedy? What do you do with tragedy? You keep on going. What 
will separate you from the love of God. I got an answer for you. Maybe it's death, life, demons, things present, things to come. What is your faith worth? And so I walked away from my brother's accident with his blood on my shirt. And I believe in God still. Because the God who allowed him to die could raise the dead. It's just that God decided he wasn't going to do it that day. God could stop people from doing anything. So whatever he allowed to happen has a bigger reason than you could ever understand. And if anybody, you hear me? If anybody thinks they're big enough to try and accuse you or explain something, I dare them. You know, God has a sense of humor. He'll put the plug on them and see how they react. The Bible says, judge that you be not judged. You start judging, God put the plug on you, see how you handle it. Thy will be done. What a beautiful prayer. Thy will be done. Because I don't understand the whole will. So thy will be done. Not my will, Jesus said. Thy will be done. I want this cup to go away. I don't want to go to the cross. don't want to go to the pain and the whip and all the slapping and the spitting in my face. He said, but tell you what, whatever you will, no problem. What are you willing to go through with your faith? And I walked away with my brother's blood on my shirt. I had to go home sit in the house and ask God I preach that you are the resurrection I preach that you are the healer why didn't you let my brother live and the Lord says you know 